Well, it truly is a horrible night out there, but what better place to hide from the thunder and rain than in here with me? I've got some horror stories for you. So it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. A few miles from Boston, in Massachusetts, there is a deep inlet winding several miles into the interior of the country from Charles Bay and terminating in a thickly wooded swamp or morass. On one side of this inlet is a beautiful dark grove. On the opposite side, the land rises abruptly from the water's edge into a high ridge on which grow a few scattered oaks of great age and immense size. Under one of these gigantic trees, according to old stories, there was a great amount of treasure buried by Kid the Pirate. The inlet allowed a facility to bring the money in a boat secretly and at night to the very foot of the hill. The elevation of the place permitted a good lookout to be kept, that no one was at hand while the remarkable trees formed good landmarks by which the place might easily be found again. The old stories add, moreover, that the devil presided at the hiding of the money and took it under his guardianship, but this, it is well known, he always does with buried treasure particularly when it has been ill-gotten. Be that as it may, Kidd never returned to recover his wealth, being shortly after seized at Boston, sent out to England, and there hanged for a pirate. About the year 1727, just at the time when earthquakes were prevalent in New England, and shook many tall sinners down upon their knees, there lived near this place a meagre miserly fellow of the name of Tom Walker. He had a wife as miserly as himself. They were so miserly that they even conspired to cheat each other. Whatever the woman could lay her hands on, she hid away. A hen could not cackle before she was on the alert to secure the new laid egg. Her husband was continually prying about to detect her secret hordes, and many and fierce were the conflicts that took place about what ought to have been common property. They lived in a forlorn-looking house that stood alone and had an air of starvation. A few straggling savin trees, emblems of sterility, grew near it. No smoke ever curled from its chimney. No traveller stopped at its door. A miserable horse, whose ribs were as articulate as the bars of a gridiron, stalked about a field where a thin carpet of moss, scarcely covering the ragged beds of pudding stone, tantalized and balked its hunger, and sometimes he would lean his face over the fence, look piteously at the passer-by, and seem to petition deliverance from this land of famine. The house and its inmates had altogether a bad name. Tom's wife was a tall termagant, fierce of temper, loud of tongue, and strong of arm. Her voice was often heard in wordy warfare with her husband and his face sometimes showed signs that their conflicts were not confined to words. No one ventured, however, to interfere between them. The lonely wayfarer shrunk within himself at the horrid clamour and clapper clawing, eyed the den of discord askance, and hurried on his way, rejoicing, if a bachelor, in his celibacy. One day that Tom Walker had been to a distant part of the neighbourhood, he took what he considered a shortcut homewards through the swamp. Well, like most shortcuts, it was an ill-chosen route. The swamp was thickly grown with great gloomy pines and hemlocks, some of them ninety feet high, which made it dark at noonday, and a retreat for all the hours of the neighbourhood. It was full of pits and quagmires, partly covered with weeds and mosses, where the green surface often betrayed the traveller into a gulf of black, smothering mud. There were also dark and stagnant pools, the abodes of the tadpole, the bullfrog, and the water snake, and where trunks of pines and hemlocks lay half drowned, half rotting, looking like alligators sleeping in the mire. Tom had been picking his way cautiously through the treacherous forest, stepping from tuft to tuft of rushes and roots which afforded precarious footholds among deep sloughs, or pacing carefully, like a cat along the prostrate trunks of trees, startled now and then by the sudden screaming of the bittern, or the quacking of a wild duck, rising on the wing from some solitary pool. 
At length he arrived at a piece of firm ground which ran out like a peninsula into the deep bosom of the swamp. It had been one of the strongholds of the Indians during their wars with the first colonists. Here they had thrown up a kind of fort which they had looked upon as almost impregnable and had used as a place of refuge for their squaws and children. Nothing remained of the Indian fort but a few embankments gradually sinking to the level of the surrounding earth, and already overgrown in part by oaks and other forest trees, the foliage of which formed a contrast to the dark pines and hemlocks of the swamp. It was late in the dusk of evening that Tom Walker reached the old fort, and he paused there for a while to rest himself. Anyone but he would have felt unwilling to linger in this lonely, melancholic place, for the common people had a bad opinion of it from the stories handed down from the time of the Indian Wars, when it was asserted that the savages held incantations here and made sacrifices to the evil spirit. Tom Walker, however, was not a man to be troubled with any fears of that kind. He reposed himself for some time on the trunk of a fallen hemlock, listening to the boding cry of the tree toad, and delving with his walking staff into a mound of black mould at his feet. As he turned up the soil unconsciously, his staff struck against something hard. He raked it out of the vegetable mould, and lo, a cloven skull with an Indian tomahawk buried deep in it lay before him. Now the rust on the weapon showed the time that had elapsed since this death blow had been given. It was a dreary memento of the fierce struggle that had taken place in this last foothold of the Indian warriors. Humph, said Tom Walker, as he gave the skull a kick to shake the dirt from it. Let that skull alone, said a gruff voice. Tom lifted up his eyes and beheld a great black man, seated directly opposite him on the stump of a tree. He was exceedingly surprised, having neither seen nor heard anyone approach and he was still more perplexed on observing, as well as the gathering gloom would permit, that the stranger was neither Negro nor Indian. It is true he was dressed in a rude half-Indian garb, and had a red belt or sash swathed around his body, but his face was neither black nor copper colour, but rather swarthy and dingy and begrimed with soot, as if he had been accustomed to toil among fires and forges. He had a shock of coarse black hair that stood out from his head in all directions and bore an axe on his shoulder. He scowled for a moment at Tom with a pair of great red eyes. "'What are you doing on my grounds?' said the black man with a hoarse, growling voice. "'Your grounds,' said Tom with a sneer. "'No more your grounds than mine. They belong to Deacon Peabody.' Deacon Peabody, be dead, said the stranger. As I flatter myself, he will be, if he does not look more to his own sins and less to his neighbors. Look yonder, and see how Deacon Peabody is faring. Tom looked in the direction that the stranger pointed, and beheld one of the great trees, fair and flourishing without, but rotten at the core, and saw that it had been nearly hewn through, so that the first high wind was likely to blow it down. On the bark of the tree was scored the name of Deacon Peabody. He now looked round and found most of the tall trees marked with the name of some great men of the colony, and all more or less scored by the axe. The one on which he had been seated, and which had evidently just been hewn down, bore the name of Crowning Shield and he recollected a mighty rich man of that name who made a vulgar display of wealth, which it was whispered he'd acquired by buccaneering. Uh, he's just ready for burning, said the black man with a growl of triumph. You see, I'm likely to have a good stock of firewood for winter. But what right to have you, said Tom, to cut down Deacon Peabody's timber? The right of prior claim, said the other. This woodland belonged to me long before one of your white-faced race put foot upon this soil. And pray, who are you, if I may be so bold, said Tom. Oh, 
I go by various names. I'm the wild huntsman in some countries, the black miner in others. In this neighborhood, I'm known by the name of the black woodsman. I am he to whom the red man devoted this spot and, and now and then roasted a white man by way of sweet smell and sacrifice. Since the red men have been exterminated by you white savages, I amuse myself by presiding at the persecutions of Quakers and Anabaptists. I am the great patron and prompter of slave dealers, and the grand master of the Salem witches. The upshot of all which is that, if I mistake not, said Tom sturdily, you are he commonly called Old Scratch. The same at your service, replied the black man, with a half-civil nod. Such was the opening of this interview, according to the old story, though it has almost too familiar an air to be credited. One would think that to meet with such a singular personage in this wild, lonely place would have shaken any man's nerves. But Tom was a hard-minded fellow, not easily daunted, and he lived so long with a termagant wife that he did not even fear the devil. It is said that, after this commencement, they had a long and earnest conversation together as Tom returned homewards. The black man told him of great sums of money which had been buried by Kid the Pirate, under the oak trees on the high ridge not far from the morass. All these were under his command and protected by his power, so that none could find them but such as propitiated his favour. These he offered to place within Tom Walker's reach, having conceived an especial kindness for him, but they were only to be had on certain conditions. What these conditions were may easily be surmised, though Tom never disclosed them publicly. They must have been very hard, for he required time to think of them, and he was not a man to stick at trifles where money was in view. When they'd reached the edge of the swamp, the stranger paused. What proof have I that all you've been telling me is true? asked Tom. There is my signature, said the black man, pressing his finger on Tom's forehead. So saying, he turned off among the thickets of the swamp, and seemed, as Tom said, to go down, 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 into the earth, until nothing but his head and shoulders could be seen, and so on, until he totally disappeared. When Tom reached home, he found the black print of a finger burnt, as it were, into his forehead, which nothing could obliterate. The first news his wife had to tell him was the sudden death of Absalom Crowninshield, the rich buccaneer. It was announced in the papers with the usual flourish that a great man had fallen in Israel. Tom recollected the tree which his black friend had just hewn down, and which was ready for burning. Let the free Buddha roast, said Tom. Who cares? He now felt convinced that all he had heard and seen was no illusion. He was not prone to let his wife into his confidence, but as this was an uneasy secret, he willingly shared it with her. All her avarice was awakened at the mention of hidden gold, and she urged her husband to comply with the black man's terms and secure what would make them wealthy for life. However Tom might have felt disposed to sell himself to the devil, he was determined not to do so to oblige his wife, so he flatly refused out of the mere spirit of contradiction. Many and bitter were the quarrels they had on the subject, but the more she talked, the more resolute was Tom not to be damned to please her. At length she determined to drive the bargain on her own account, and if she succeeded, to keep all the gain to herself. Being of the same fearless temper as her husband, she set off for the old Indian fort towards the close of a summer's day. She was many hours absent, but when she came back she was reserved and sullen in her replies. She spoke something of a black man whom she had met about twilight, hewing at the root of a tall tree. He was sulky, however, and would not come to terms, she was to go again with a propitiatory offering, but what it was, she forbore to say. 
The next evening she set off again for the swamp, with her apron heavily laden. Tom waited and waited for her, but in vain. Midnight came, but she did not make her appearance. Morning, noon, night returned, but she still did not come. Tom now grew uneasy for her safety, especially as he found she carried off in her apron the silver teapot and spoons and every portable article of value. Another night elapsed, another morning came, but no wife. In a word, she was never heard of more. What was her real fate, nobody knows, in consequence of so many pretending to know. It's one of those facts that have become confounded by a variety of historians. Some asserted that she lost her way among the tangled mazes of the swamp and sunk into some pit or slough. Others, more uncharitable, hinted that she had eloped with the household booty and made off to some other province, while others assert that the tempter had decoyed her into a dismal quagmire on top of which her hat was found lying. In confirmation of this, it was said a great black man with an axe on his shoulder was seen late that very evening coming out of the swamp, carrying a bundle tied in a check apron with an air of surly triumph. The most current and probable story, however, observed that Tom Walker grew so anxious about the fate of his wife and his property that he set out at length to seek them both at the Indian fort. During a long summer's afternoon, he searched about the gloomy place, but no wife was to be seen. He called her name repeatedly, but she was nowhere to be heard. The bittern alone responded to his voice as he flew screaming by, while the bullfrog croaked dolefully from a neighbouring pool. At length, it is said, just in the brown hour of twilight, when the owls began to hoot and the bats to flit about, his attention was attracted by the clamour of carrion crows that were hovering about a cypress tree. He looked and beheld a bundle tied in a check apron and hanging in the branches of the tree with a great vulture perched hard by, as if keeping watch upon it. Ah, well, he leaped with joy, for he recognised his wife's apron, and supposed it to contain the household valuables. "'Let us get hold of the property,' said he, consolingly to himself, "'and we will endeavour to do without the woman.' As he scrambled up the tree, the vulture spread its wide wings and sailed off, screaming into the deep shadows of the forest. Tom seized the check apron, but, woe, full sight, found nothing but a heart and liver tied up in it. Such, according to the most authentic old story, was all that was to be found of Tom's wife. She had probably attempted to deal with the black man as she had been accustomed to dealing with her husband, but though a female scold is generally considered a match for the devil, Yet in this instance she appears to have had the worst of it. She must have died game, however, for it is said Tom noticed many prints of cloven feet deeply stamped about the tree, and several handfuls of hair that looked as if it had been plucked from the coarse black shock of the woodsman. Tom knew his wife's prowess by experience. He shrugged his shoulders as he looked at the signs of a fierce clapper clawing. He gad! he said to himself. Old Scratch must have had a tough time of it. Tom consoled himself for the loss of his property with the loss of his wife, for he was a man of fortitude. He even felt something like gratitude towards the black woodsman, who he considered had done him a kindness. He sought, therefore, to cultivate a further acquaintance with him, but for some time without success. The old black legs played shy for Whatever people may think, he's not always to be had for calling for. He knows how to play his cards when pretty sure of his game. At length, it is said, when delay had whetted Tom's eagerness to the quick, and prepared him to agree to anything rather than not gain the promised treasure, he met the black man one evening in his usual woodman dress, with his axe on his shoulder, sauntering along the edge of the swamp and humming a tune. He affected to receive Tom's advance with great indifference, 
made brief replies, and went on humming his tune. By degrees, however, Tom brought him to business, and they began to haggle about the terms on which the former was to have the pirate's treasure. There was one condition which need not be mentioned, being generally understood in all cases where the devil grants favours, but there were others about which, though of less importance, he was inflexibly obstinate. He insisted that the money found through his means should be employed in his service. He proposed, therefore, that Tom should employ it in the black traffic, that is to say that he would fit out a slave ship. This, however, Tom resolutely refused. He was bad enough in all conscience, but the devil himself could not tempt him to turn slave-dealer. Finding Tom so squeamish on this point, he did not insist upon it, but proposed instead that he should turn Uzura, the devil being extremely anxious for the increase of Uzuras, looking upon them as his peculiar people. To this no objections were made, for it was just to Tom's taste. "'You shall open a broker's shop in Boston next month,' said the black man. "'I'll do it tomorrow, if you wish,' said Tom Walker. "'You shall lend money at two per cent a month.' <laughs> "'Gad, I'll charge four, replied Tom Walker. "'You shall extort bonds, foreclose mortgages, drive the merchant to bankruptcy. "'I'll drive him to the... Oh cried Tom Walker, eagerly. "'You are the Azura for my money,' said the Blacklegs, with delight. "'So when will you want the rile? "'This very night.' "'Done,' said the devil. "'Done,' said Tom Walker. "'So they shook hands and struck a bargain. A few days' time saw Tom Walker seated behind his desk in a counting-house in Boston. His reputation for a ready-moneyed man, who would lend money out for a good consideration, soon spread abroad. Everybody remembers the days of Governor Belcher, when money was particularly scarce. It was a time of paper credit. The country had been deluged with government bills. The famous land bank had been established. There had been a rage for speculating. The people had run mad with schemes for new settlements, for building cities in the wilderness. Land jobbers went about with maps of grants and townships and El Dorados, lying nobody knew where but which everybody was ready to purchase. In a word, the great speculating fever, which breaks out every now and then in the country, had raged to an alarming degree, and everybody was dreaming of making sudden fortunes from nothing. As usual, the fever had subsided. The dream had gone off, and the imaginary fortunes with it. The patients were left in doleful plight, and the whole country resounded with the consequent cry of hard times. At this propitious time of public distress did Tom Walker set up as an azura in Boston. His door was soon thronged by customers, the needy and the adventurous, the gambling speculator, the dreaming land jobber, the thriftless tradesman, the merchant with crack credit. In short, every one driven to raise money by desperate means and desperate sacrifices hurried to Tom Walker. Thus, Tom was the universal friend of the needy, and he acted like a friend in need. That is to say, he always exacted good pay and good security. In proportion to the distress of the applicant was the hardness of his terms. He accumulated bonds and mortgages, gradually squeezed his customers closer and closer, and sent them at length dry as a sponge from his door. In this way he made money hand over hand, became a rich and mighty man, and exalted his cocked hat upon change. He built himself, as usual, a vast house, out of ostentation, but left the greater part of it unfinished and unfurnished out of parsimony. He even set up a carriage in the fullness of his vain glory, though he nearly starved the horses which drew it. And as the young greased wheels groaned and screeched on the axle trees, you would have thought you heard the souls of the poor debtors he was squeezing. 
As Tom waxed old, however, he grew thoughtful. Having secured the good things of this world, he began to feel anxious about those of the next. He thought, with regret, on the bargain he'd made with his black friend, and set his wits to work to cheat him out of the conditions. He became, therefore, all of a sudden, a violent churchgoer. He prayed loudly and strenuously, as if heaven were to be taken by force of lungs. Indeed, one might always tell when he'd sinned most during the week, by the clamour of his Sunday devotion. The quiet Christians, who had been modestly and steadfastly travelling Zionward, were struck with self-reproach at seeing themselves so suddenly outstripped in their career by this new-made convert. Tom was as rigid in religious as in money matters. He was a stern supervisor and censorer of his neighbours, and seemed to think every sin entered up to their account became a credit on his own side of the page. He even talked of the expediency of reviving the persecution of Quakers and Anabaptists. In a word, Tom's zeal became as notorious as his riches. Still, in spite of all his strenuous attention to forms, Tom had a lurking dread that the devil, after all, would have his due. That he might not be taken unawares, therefore, it is said he always carried a small Bible in his coat pocket. He had also a great folio Bible on his counting-house desk, and would frequently be found reading it when people called on business. On such occasions he would lay his green spectacles on the book to mark the place while he turned round to drive some usurious bargain. Oh, some say that Tom grew a little crack-brained in his old days, and that fancying his end approaching, he had his horse new-shod, saddled and bridled, and buried with his feet uppermost, because he supposed that at the last day the world would be turned upside down, in which case he should find his horse standing ready for mounting, and he was determined, at the worst, to give his old friend a run for it. This, however, is probably a mere old wives' fable. If he really did take such a precaution, it was totally superfluous. At least so says the authentic old legend which closes his story in the following manner. On one hot afternoon in the dog days, just as a terrible black thunder gust was coming up, Tom sat in his counting house in his white linen cap and India silk morning gown. He was on the point of foreclosing a mortgage by which he would complete the ruin of an unlucky land speculator for whom he had professed the greatest friendship. The poor land jobber begged him to grant a few months' indulgence. Tom had grown testy and irritated and refused another day. "'My family will be ruined and brought upon the parish,' said the land jobber. Ah, "'Charity begins at home,' replied Tom. "'I must take care of myself in these hard times.' "'You've made so much money out of me,' said the speculator. Tom lost his patience and his piety. Let the devil take me, said he, if I have made a farthing. Just then there were three loud knocks at the street door. He stepped out to see who was there. A black man was holding a black horse which neighed and stamped with impatience. Tom, you're a comfort, said the black fellow gruffly. Tom shrunk back, but too late. He had left his little Bible at the bottom of his coat pocket, and his big Bible on the desk buried under the mortgage he was about to foreclose. Never was a sinner taken more unawares. The black man whisked him like a child astride the horse, and away he galloped in the midst of a thunderstorm. The clerks stuck their pens behind their ears and stared after him from the windows. Away went Tom Walker, dashing down the street, his white cap bobbing up and down, his morning gown fluttering in the wind, and his steed striking fire out of the pavement at every bound. When the clerks turned to look for the black man, he had disappeared. Tom Walker never returned to foreclose the mortgage. A countryman who lived on the borders of the swamp reported that, in the height of the thunder gust, he'd heard a great clattering of hooves and a howling along the road, and that, 
When he ran to the window, he just caught sight of a figure, such as I have described, on a horse that galloped like mad across the fields, over the hills, and down into the black hemlock swamp towards the old Indian fort, and that shortly after a thunderbolt fell in that direction, which seemed to have set the whole forest in a blaze. The good people of Boston shook their heads and shrugged their shoulders, but had been so much accustomed to witches and goblins and tricks of the devil in all kinds of shapes from the first settlement of the colony that they were not so much horror-struck as might have been expected. Trustees were appointed to take charge of Tom's effects. There was nothing, however, to administer upon. On searching his coffers, all his bonds and mortgages were found reduced to cinders. In place of gold and silver, his iron chest was filled with chips and shavings. Two skeletons lay in his stable instead of his half-starved horses, and the very next day his great house took fire and was burnt to the ground. Such was the end of Tom Walker and his ill-gotten wealth. Let all griping money-brokers lay this story to heart. The truth of it is not to be doubted. The very hole under the oak trees from whence he dug kids' money is to be seen to this day, and the neighbouring swamp and old Indian fort is often haunted in stormy nights by a figure on horseback, in a morning gown and white cap, which is doubtless the troubled spirit of the Azura. In fact, the story has resolved itself into a proverb, and is the origin of that popular saying prevalent throughout New England of the devil and Tom Walker. The following pages are from a notebook that was discovered lying at the foot of an oak tree beside the Lincoln Highway, between Bowman and Oban. They would have been dismissed immediately as the work of a disordered mind if it had not been for the unaccountable disappearance, eight days before, of James Buckingham and Edgar Halpin. Experts testified that the handwriting was undoubtedly that of Buckingham. A silver dollar and a handkerchief marked with Buckingham's initials were also found not far from the notebook. Not everyone, perhaps, will believe that my ten years' hatred for Edgar Halpin was the impelling force that drove me to the perfecting of a most unique invention. Only those who have detested and loathed another man with the black further of the feeling I had conceived will understand the patience with which I sought to devise a revenge that should be safe and adequate at the same time. The wrong he had done me was one that must be expiated sooner or later, and nothing short of his death would be sufficient. However, I did not care to hang, not even for a crime that I could regard as nothing more than the mere execution of justice, and, as a lawyer, I knew how difficult, how practically impossible, was the commission of a murder that would leave no betraying evidence. Therefore I puzzled long and fruitlessly as to the manner in which Halpin should die, before my inspiration came to me. I had reason enough to hate Edgar Halpin. We had been bosom friends all through our school days and through the first years of our professional life as law partners. But when Halpin married the one woman I had ever loved with complete devotion, all friendship ceased on my side and was replaced by an ice-like barrier of inexorable enmity. Even the death of Alice five years after the marriage made no difference, for I could not forgive the happiness of which I had been deprived, the happiness that they would shared during those years, like the thieves they were. I felt that she would have cared for me if it had not been for Halpin. Indeed, she and I had been almost engaged before the beginning of his rivalry. It must not be supposed, however, that I was indiscreet enough to betray my feelings at any time. Halpin was my daily associate in the open law firm to which we belonged, and I continued to be a most welcome and frequent guest at his home. I doubt if he ever knew that I cared greatly for Alice. I am secretive and undemonstrative by temperament, and also I am proud. No one except Alice herself ever surmised my suffering, and even she knew nothing of my resentment. Halpin himself trusted me, and, nurturing as I did the idea of retaliation at some future time, I took care that he should continue to trust me. 
I made myself necessary to him in all ways. I helped him when my heart was a cauldron of seething poisons. I spoke words of brotherly affection and clapped him on the back when I would rather have driven a dagger through him. I knew all the tortures and all the nausea of a hypocrite. And day after day, year after year, I made varying plans for an ultimate revenge. Apart from my legal studies and duties, during those ten years, I apprised myself of everything available that dealt with the methods of murder. Crimes of passion allured me with a fateful interest, and I read untiringly the records of particular cases. I made a study of weapons and poisons, and as I studied them, I pictured to myself the death of Halpin in every conceivable way. I imagined the deed as being done at all hours of the day and night, in a multitude of places. The only flaw in these dreams was my inability to think of any spot that would assure perfect safety from subsequent detection. It was my bent towards scientific speculation and experiment that finally gave me the clue I sought. I had long been familiar with the theory that other worlds or dimensions may coexist in the same space with ours, by reason of a different molecular structure and vibrational rate, rendering them intangible to us. One day, when I was indulging in a murderous fantasy, in which for the thousandth time I imagined myself throttling Halpin with my bare hands, it occurred to me that some unseen dimension, if one could only penetrate it, would be the ideal place for the commission of a homicide. All circumstantial evidence, as well as the corpse itself, would be lacking, in other words. One would have a perfect absence of what is known as the corpus delicti. The problem of how to obtain entrance to this dimension was, of course, an unsolved one, but I did not feel that it would necessarily prove insoluble. I set myself immediately to a consideration of the difficulties to be overcome, and the possible ways and means. There are reasons why I do not care to set forth in this narrative the details of the various experiments to which I was drawn during the next three years. The theory that underlay my tests and researches was a very simple one, but the processes involved were highly intricate. In brief, the premise from which I worked was that the vibratory rate of objects in the fourth dimension could be artificially established by means of some mechanism and that things or persons exposed to the influence of the vibration could be transported thereby to this alien realm. For a long time all my experiments were condemned to failure, because I was groping among mysterious powers and recondite laws whose motive, principle, I had not wholly grasped. I will not even hint at the basic nature of the device which brought my ultimate success, for I do not want others to follow where I have gone and find themselves in the same dismal predicament. I will say, however, that the desired vibration was attained by condensing ultraviolet rays in a refractive apparatus made of certain very sensitive materials which I will not name. The resultant power was stored in a kind of battery, and could be emitted from a vibratory disc suspended above an ordinary office chair, exposing everything beneath the disc to the influence of the new vibration. The range of the influence could be closely regulated by means of an insulating attachment. By the use of the apparatus, I finally succeeded in precipitating various articles into the fourth dimension. A dinner plate, a bust of Dante, a Bible, a French novel and a house cat. All disappeared from sight and touch in a few instants when the ultraviolet power was turned upon them. I knew that henceforth they were functioning as atomic entities in a world where all things had the same vibratory rate that had been artificially induced by means of my mechanism. Before venturing into the invisible domain myself, it was of course necessary to have some way of returning. I invented a second battery and a second vibratory disc, through which, by the use of certain infrared rays, the vibrations of our own world could be established. By turning the force from the disc on the very same spot where the dinner plate and other articles had disappeared, I succeeded in recovering all of them. All were absolutely unchanged, and though several months had gone by, the cat had not suffered in any way from its fourth dimensional incarceration. The infrared device was portable, and I meant to take it with me on my visit to the new realm in the company of Edgar Halpin. 
I, but not helping, would return anon to resume the threads of mundane existence. My experiments had all been carried on with utter secrecy. To mask their real nature, as well as to provide myself with the needful privacy, I built a small laboratory in the woods of an uncultivated ranch that I owned, lying midway between Oban and Bowman. Here I retired at varying intervals when I had the requisite leisure, ostensibly to conduct some chemical experiments of an educative but far from unusual type. I never admitted anyone to the laboratory, and no great amount of curiosity was evinced by friends and acquaintances regarding its contents or the tests I was carrying on. Never did I breathe a syllable to anyone that could indicate the true goal of my researches. I shall never forget the jubilation I felt when the infrared device had proven its practicality by retrieving the plate, the bust, the two volumes, and the cat. I was so eager for the consummation of my long-delayed revenge that I did not even consider a preliminary personal trip into the fourth dimension. I had determined that Edgar Halpin must precede me when I went. I did not feel, however, that it would be wise to tell him anything concerning the real nature of my device, or the uh, proposed excursion. Halpin, at this time, was suffering from recurrent attacks of terrific neuralgia. One day, when he complained more than usual, I told him, under the seal of confidence, that I had been working on a vibratory invention for the relief of such maladies, and had finally perfected it. I'll take you out to the laboratory tonight. You can try it, I said. Oh, it'll fix you up in a jiffy. All you'll have to do will be to sit on a chair and let me turn on the current. But don't say anything to anybody. Thanks, old man, he rejoined. I'll certainly be grateful if you can do anything to stop this damnable pain. It feels like electric drills boring through my head all the time. I had chosen my time well for... All things were favourable to the maintenance of the secrecy I desired. Halpin lived on the outskirts of the town, and he was alone for the nonce, his housekeeper having gone away on a brief visit to some sick relative. The night was murky and foggy, and I drove to Halpin's house and stopped for him shortly after the dinner hour, when few people were abroad. I do not think anyone saw us when we left the town. I followed a rough and little used by road for most of the way to my laboratory, saying that I did not care to meet other cars in the thick fog, if I could avoid it. We passed no one, and I felt this was a good omen, and that everything had combined to further my plan. Halpin uttered an exclamation of surprise when I turned on the lights in my laboratory. I didn't dream he had so much stuff here, he remarked peering about with respectful curiosity as the long array of unsuccessful appliances which I had thrown aside in the course of my labours. I pointed to the chair above which the ultraviolet vibrator was suspended. "'Take a seat, Ed,' I enjoined him. "'We'll soon cure everything that ails you.' Uh, "'Sure you ain't gonna electrocute me?' he joked, as he obeyed my direction. A thrill of fierce triumph ran through me like the stimulation of some rare elixir. When he had seated himself, everything was in my power now, and the moment of recompense for my ten years' humiliation and suffering was at hand. Halpin was so unsuspecting. The thought of any danger to himself, of any treachery on my part, would have been fantastically incredible to him. Putting my hand beneath my coat... I caressed the hilt of the hunting knife that I carried. All set? I asked him. Sure, Mike. Go ahead and shoot. I'd found the exact range that would involve all of Halpin's body without affecting the chair itself. Fixing my gaze upon him, I pressed the little knob that turned on the current of vibratory rays. The result was practically instantaneous for he seemed to melt like a puff of thinning smoke. I could still see his outlines for a moment, and the look of a phantasmal astonishment on his face. And then he was gone. Utterly gone. Perhaps it will be a source of wonderment that, having annihilated Halpin as far as all earthly existence was concerned, 
I was not content merely to leave him in the unseen, intangible plane to which he had been transposed. Would that I had been content to do so. But the wrong I'd suffered was hot and cankerous within me, and I could not bear to think that he still lived in any form or upon any plane. Nothing but absolute death would suffice to assuage my resentment, and the death must be inflicted by my own hand. It now remained to follow Halpin into that realm which no man had ever visited before, and of whose geographical conditions and characteristics I had formed no idea whatsoever. I felt sure, however, that I could enter it and return safely, after disposing of my victim. The return of the cat left no apparent room for doubt on that score. I turned out the lights, and seating myself in the chair with a portable infrared vibrator in my arms, I switched on the ultraviolet power. The sensation I felt was that of one who falls with nightmare velocity into a great gulf. My ears were deaf with the intolerable thunder of my descent. A frightful sickness overcame me, and I was near to losing all consciousness for a moment in the black vortex of roaring space and force that seemed to draw me in a deer wood through the ultimate pits. Then the speed of my fall was gradually retarded, and I came gently down to something that was solid beneath my feet. There was a dim glimmering of light that grew stronger as my eyes accustomed themselves to it, and by this light I saw Halpin standing a few feet away. Behind him were dark, amorphous rocks and the vague outlines of a desolate landscape of low mounds and primordial treeless flats. Even though I'd hardly known what to expect, I was somewhat surprised by the character of the environment in which I found myself. At a guess, I would have said that the fourth dimension would be something more colorous and complex and varied a land of multifueled hues and many angled forms. However, in its drear and primitive desolation, the place was truly ideal for the commission of the act I had intended. Halpin came toward me in the doubtful light. There was a dazed and almost idiotic look on his face, and he stuttered a little as he tried to speak. Oh, what happened? he articulated at last. Never mind what happened. It isn't a circumstance to what's going to happen now. I laid the portable vibrator aside on the ground as I spoke. The day's look was still on Halpin's face when I drew the hunting knife and stabbed him through the body with one clean thrust. In that thrust, all the stifled hatred, all the cankering resentment of ten insufferable years was finally vindicated. He fell in a twisted heap, twitched a little, and lay still. The blood oozed very slowly from his side and formed a puddle. I remember wondering at its slowness even then, for the oozing seemed to go on through hours and days. Somehow, as I stood there, I was obsessed by a feeling of utter unreality. No doubt the long strain I'd been under, the daily stress of injured emotions and decade-deferred hopes, had left me unable to realize the final consummation of my desire when it came. The whole thing seemed no more than one of the homicidal daydreams in which I'd imagined myself stabbing Halpern to the heart and seeing his hateful body lie before me. At length, I decided that it was time to effect my return, for surely nothing could be gained by lingering any longer inside Halpin's corpse amid the unutterable dreariness of the fourth-dimensional landscape. I erected the vibrator in a position where its rays could be turned upon myself, and pressed the switch. I was aware of a sudden vertigo, I felt that I was about to begin another descent into fathomless vortical gulfs. But, though the vertigo persisted, nothing happened, and I found that I was still standing beside the corpse, in the same dismal milieu. Dumbfoundment and growing consternation crept over me. Apparently, for some unknown reason, the vibrator would not work in the way I'd so confidently expected. Perhaps in these new surroundings there was some barrier to the full development of the infrared power. I do not know, but at any rate there I was, in a truly singular and far from agreeable predicament. I do not know how long I fooled in a mounting frenzy with the mechanism of the vibrator, in the hope that something had temporarily gone wrong and could be remedied 
if the difficulty were only found. However, all my tinkerings were of no avail. The machine was in perfect working order, but the required force was wanting. I tried the experiment of exposing small articles to the influence of the rays. A silver coin in a handkerchief dissolved and disappeared very slowly. I felt they must have regained the levels of mundane existence, but evidently the vibrational force was not strong enough to transport a human being. Finally, I gave it up and threw the vibrator to the ground. In the surge of a violent despair that came upon me, I felt the need of muscular action, a prolonged movement, and I started off at once to explore the weird realm in which I had involuntarily imprisoned myself. It was an unearthly land, a land such as might have existed before the creation of life. There were undulating blanks of desolation beneath the uniform grey of a heaven without moon or sun or stars or clouds, from which an uncertain and diffused glimmering was cast upon the world beneath. There were no shadows, for the light seemed to emanate from all directions. The soil was a grey dust in places, and a grey fissidity of slime in others, and the mounds I have already mentioned were like the backs of prehistoric monsters heaving from the primal ooze. There were no signs of insect or animal life. There were no trees, no herbs, not even a blade of grass, a patch of moss or lichen, or a trace of algae. Many rocks were strewn chaotically through the desolation, and their forms were such as an idiotic demon might have devised in aping the handiwork of God. The light was so dim that all things were lost at a little distance, and I could not tell whether the horizon was near or far. It seems to me that I must have wandered on for several hours, maintaining as direct a course of progression as I could. I had a compass, a thing that I always carry with me, but it refused to function. I was driven to conclude that there were no magnetic poles in this new world. Suddenly, as I rounded a pile of the vast, amorphous boulders, I came to a human body that lay huddled on the ground, and say, incredulously, that it was Halpin. The blood still oozed from the fabric of his coat, and the pool it had formed was no larger than when I had begun my journey. I felt sure that I had not wandered in a circle, as people are said to do amid unfamiliar surroundings. How, then? I have returned to the scene of my crime. Oh, the problem nearly drove me mad as I pondered it, and I set off with frantic vigour in an opposite direction from the one I'd first taken. For all intents and purposes, the scene which I now passed was identical with the one that lay on the other side of Halpin's course. It was hard to believe that the low mounds, the drear levels of dust and ooze, and the monstrous boulders were not the same as those among which I had made my former way. As I went, I took out my watch with the idea of timing my progress, but the hands had stopped at the very moment when I'd taken my plunge into the unknown space from the laboratory, and though I wound it carefully, it refused to run. After walking an enormous distance, during which, to my surprise, I felt no fatigue whatever, I came once more to the body I had sought to leave. I think that I went really mad then, for a little while. Now, after a duration of time or eternity which I have no means of computing, I am writing this penciled account on the leaves of my notebook. I am writing it beside the corpse of Edgar Halpin, from which I have been unable to flee, for a score of excursions into the dim realms on all sides have ended by bringing me back to it after a certain interval. The corpse is still fresh, and the blood has not dried. Apparently, the thing we know as time is well-nigh non-existent in this world, or at any rate is seriously disordered in its action, and most of the normal concomitants of time are likewise absent, and space itself has the property of returning always to the same point. The voluntary movements I perform might be considered as a sort of time sequence, but but in regard to involuntary things, there is little or no time movement. I experience neither physical weariness or hunger, but the horror of my situation is not to be conveyed in human language, and hell itself can hardly have devised a name for it. 
when I have finished writing this narration, I shall precipitate the notebook into the levels of mundane life by means of the infrared vibrator. Some obscure need of confessing my crime and telling my predicament to others has led me to an act which I should never have believed myself capable, for I am the most uncommunicative of men by nature. Apart from satisfying this need, the composition of my narrative is something to do. It's a temporary reprieve from the desperate madness that will surge upon me soon, and the grey, eternal horror of the limbo to which I have doomed myself beside the undecaying body of my victim. Well, I have to say this, you are constantly, constantly pestering me. Well, maybe not constantly, but quite often. <laughs> pestering me to do some of the old school classics, H.P. Lovecraft, Edgar Allan Poe and the like. And those are a couple of very old stories that I hope you really enjoyed. Set to the background of a thunderstorm. Yes, it's nice to be inside, isn't it? In the warm when the thunder and rain are happening outside. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that was a lot of fun for me to do, and if you'd like me to do it again, I will definitely, definitely oblige. A couple of hundreds of year old, well, I don't know, a couple of hundred year old story and a hundred year old story, I guess. Well, it was a lot of fun to do, like I said, and I would love to do it again. So if you want more, comments in the comments section below the video, please. Back again very soon. You're going to join me, aren't you? Of course you are. But until then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?